Hello, and welcome to Rome 2. Episode 34, War, the Battle of Patavium. So, picking up right where we left off, except instead of ending the turn, as usual, I listened to uh, Saturday's bonus episode, and I want to change what I want to do. Now, I did not record an episode for Monday, I must apologize, I was extremely under the weather, but uh, we're back here and we're going to get an episode out on Wednesday. So yeah, we'll have a little bit of something to look forward to. Now, what I was thinking here while I was listening is that we have two armies here raiding the territory of the Venetians, which is nice. We are up to 7,518 denarii per turn. However, if that army there, the mountain men, led by Budogonatus, the king, makes it back into the city of Medhalan, we are going to be in a lot of trouble. Medhalan, as it is right now, is going to be a pain to take. Put a full 20 stack in there, and it's going to be near impossible. So I was thinking to myself, I even said it in last episode, that that would be troublesome. We have the initiative right now, and I think that means we have to take out the mountain men right now. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to lead off this episode with the Battle of Patavium. So I'm going to take Legio 5 here, led by Marcus Junius Brutus. It's pretty much a green legion. I don't think Marcus Junius Brutus has ever seen combat, nor has any of his troops, but it is a fully Polybian legion. So it's pretty beefy, right? It's pretty stacked. We're going to take him out of that raiding stance, and we're going to move him right in front of this army here. Now, we're not at war yet, so that means we can move within his aura here. For those of you that can't see, there's a red circle around him, and that's kind of the aura that normally you can't move in. Now, if we were to attack him, he's going to have the support of the city of Patavium. So we're also going to take Legio II, led by Lucius Julius Libo, and we're going to move him close enough so that he can also support Legio V. This way you're going to have Legio V, led by Marcus Junius Brutus, who will be the main commander, with Legio II, led by Lucius Julius Libo in support, versus the mountain men, led by Budogonatus the king, and Patavium, right, the garrison supporting. Now, I could have had Lucius Julius Libo potentially initiate, but I kind of want to save his troops for now. Remember, he's still a Camillan legion, so they're not as quote-unquote good as the Polybian legionaries, even though they're more experienced. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to loop... Lucius Julius Libo back down to Genoa most likely, or have him march directly on Medhalan. I haven't thought about it yet. And the issue I'm having here is Genoa, right? Cisalpina is 79 minus 3. So if I take pretty much any city here, the province is going to revolt. So I'm going to have to have him spend at least two, maybe three turns in Genoa restoring order. So those are my thoughts. Without further ado, let's uh, go ahead and open up our diplomatic tab. Speak to the Venetians. Speak quickly and well. Speak ill or slowly and I may feed your tongue to the dogs. And we're going to declare war. War! Oh, a good word! Honest! Our men will take your head. I pity you are not a handsome people. It's been a while since we've declared war on a group of people that were actively going to invade. Like, like I said, Carthage declared war on us back in like turn 14 and we've only really taken Carthaginian cities since then like yeah we took Terrace from Epiros but beyond that we've just been focused on Carthage so now we got a new friend to focus on here so uh, the mountain men led by Burogonatus is in a fortified stance so he will receive bonuses for that but beyond that we're hoping he doesn't run away here so let's hope he accepts my challenge it turns out he did so in total we're going to have 7,000 Romans versus 7,175 Venetians. The auto-resolve says a Pyrrhic victory, but that's obviously inaccurate. We have Legio V, led by Marcus Junius Brutus, with Legio II, led by Lucius Julius Libo in support, that is Rome, versus Budogonatos and the Mountain Men, that's a 17 stack, and the Garrison Army, led by... Minimantis. The garrison army is 4,125 men, right? Barbarians love to have large armies, but our legionaries should be able to hold. So, without further ado, let's get this battle started. 
the Battle of Pataviam, 260 BCE. Roma versus the Venetian. Now, they were in a fortified stance, so they have a camp that they could play around, but the AI is notorious for kind of just marching out of that camp. Now, they do have some good units mixed in there. They have a couple noble units, they have a couple regular units, and not too many backup units. So this first army is pretty beefy. The goal is going to be to get Legio 5 in there and engaged with the mountain men before they have a chance for the reinforcements to show up. And then our reinforcements are going to trickle in at the same time theirs do. But we have five cavalry in our reinforcements, so we're going to sprint them to the battlefield as quick as possible and get them engaged either with the enemy range units or doing whatever we need to do to kind of screen Legio 5. So, as the attacking force, you may choose to wait for more favorable weather conditions before commencing your attack. It's dry, so we're going to start our deployment here. And as those of you that can see, can see we have the Benici camp there. We're going to go ahead and do what we always do. We're going to line up our Princapes right here in the middle. And then we're going to put two Triaria on each side. Kind of make this line as long as possible. Then we're going to put two Equites on the uh, right two equites on the left, and then we're going to put our general in the middle here, and he'll go wherever he needs to. So general will be battle group 10, equites will battle group 8 and uh, 9, and then our main infantry force will be battle group 1. So, we're ready. We're going to kind of march out as quick as possible here, and then get our reinforcements in. So let's start the battle, and uh, get moving. So we're getting everyone moving up fast speed here, right? We're not marching slow. We want to take advantage. And then uh, we're going to get our general coming up already. And our four Triari are in. We're going to have the Triari come in behind the main group. And then once our Princapes are in, they're going to come in on our right side as a flanking force because the enemy reinforcements, I'm assuming, will come in on the right side. But that's yet to be seen. We'll have to kind of figure it out. Uh, the enemy is charging out the cavalry so it's good they're getting their cavalry out gives me an uh, opportunity to uh, potentially take out their cavalry here if they get too far ahead which it looks like they might do we're gonna go ahead and move our legionaries up a little bit more and then uh, elongate our line looks like they have more cavalry on the left so I'm sending the general over to the left and we'll go from there Equites are in, so we're going to get our Equites charging up as well. And, uh, yeah, I think all our reinforcements are in and moving. Let me double check here. Yeah, they're all moving. We're all good. So it looks like Cavalry Force has already charged One into of our me. Units is used our general is under so attack. we're going to go ahead and have our General help out. Equites. We're going to take our two Equites on the left and slam into these Venetian Equites. And then we're going to take our Equites on the right and have them slam into the Equites of Venetian as well. General. The general successfully chased off those other Equites, so we're good. We're going to move our infantry line up again. And, uh, yeah. Equites are on the left, engaged. The enemy cavalry is redeploying to our left as well. So we have two on two Equites on the left. I have Triarii coming into support, and the general is on his way to support. And then I have two Equites and a Triarii on the right. And we're going to hopefully get these enemy Equites uh, shattered. They are the Equites Venici, those are regular Equites, and then Equites Optimi Venici. So those are your noble that, uh, Equites or your advanced Equites, right? Those are like a, a noble cavalry type of deal. But it's looking good. Uh, we're going to go ahead and deploy our reinforcement Equites all the way over to the right-hand side. We're going to try to get vision of the enemy coming in. And we have these Equites Venici Optimi surrounded here. Continue to do our best to try to take them out. It looks like uh, Budo Ganatis here is not on cavalry. He is in a hoplite formation, so that's what we're dealing with there. Oh, 
no sign of the reinforcements yet. And we have not made the enemy epitaphs shatter just yet. We're working on it though. I'm going to go ahead and send an inspire and a rally. See if we can't do a little bit of damage here. So one unit of Equites is now panicking. And we do have vision of the enemy reinforcements now. They are quite a ways away. The enemy general is out here by himself. So we're actually going to go ahead and try to take out the enemy general. Not sure what they're doing by themselves there, but they are. If they want to just stay by themselves, then uh, I will absolutely engage them. Maybe that'll force the enemy uh, infantry to come up. So my cavalry did take a pretty good amount of damage there. Down to uh, 50, 70, 69, and 98 units. General's still good, but those... Uh, those Venetian equites did a pretty good number on me. One of our units has used all its ammunition. So we've now surrounded that enemy general. I'm gonna go ahead and get our units in there and uh, try to do some damage. We're just gonna keep it three principes against the enemy Hoplitai, and then we're gonna keep our. Uh, general nearby for support. But yeah, looking good so far. We're gonna put our Triari back in the main line here. And then, uh, yeah, I guess we're just gonna have these three Principe units work on the enemy general. We're actually going to have our uh, Triarii do something crazy. They're going to try to capture the enemy camp here. The enemy has left their camp. So we're going to actually move some units up. Try to capture the enemy camp and their guard towers, right? And we're going to create a long line here. Our reinforcements have come in too, so we're going to add them to the line. And then we're just going to hang out here and see what the enemy is doing. And they're mostly not retreating, but it looks like they're going to try to link up with our reinforcements. But like I said, they left their general behind here. Not sure why they would do such a thing, but they did. So yeah, we got two units of Triarii trying to enter the camp, along with uh, two units of Prankopates. The Principes are going straight for the Watchtowers, while the Triarii are going to try to block up that exit here, just in case the enemy tries to come back in their own camp. And our other infantry is moving up on the right side of the camp, where they're going to hang out. So right now, formation looks good. Like I said, the fact that the enemy is just conceding their fortified camp is a little silly, but we'll let it happen. Cavalry were within range of those towers, so we're moving them back. No need to suffer casualties if you don't have to. And then, yeah, the enemy just continues. Like I said, their main force is... They're not even running away. They're just marching away to the uh, garrison force. Like I said, while they seem to have just abandoned their general here. The general's actually going to be dead pretty soon. Four Polybian, or three Polybian Principes surrounding them is a pretty hefty damage, right? These Polybian Principes are the much, much stronger. See, we just killed them. Budokanatos, the king, is dead. They are much stronger than their uh, Camilla counterparts. So that's something else we'll have to do with Legio 2, is get those uh, units upgraded, right? The sooner the better. And we're going to focus on just taking the enemy camp here. Like I said, they left the camp open for some reason. So we're going to send a couple more Principes inside the camp and have them capture uh, the towers and the town center. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's looking good. I have no idea what the enemy's thinking. They're just kind of running away, but that's what they did. Maybe they're trying, like I said, they're trying to link up. I mean, we'll let them link up. 
I'm in no rush, because this allows me to get my troops into position, right? My troops are kind of fractured. Uh, like I said, my Polybian Equites are in a little bit of trouble. 47, 70, 68, and 95 men, so they took a good number of casualties, but... Like I said, we plan to have Legio 5 retreat to uh, either Ariminum or Retium anyways, and let them pull manpower from there. We're not going to attack the city of Patavium right away, so... What's going to happen on the campaign map is we just took out the king. So, as far as we know, the Venetians only had one army, and this was it. Once we obliterate it, they'll have to raise another army somewhere, and they'll have to designate a new king. I'm assuming they're going to do it in Medhalan, and that's not a terrible thing. But what we're looking at here is we're going to have to basically fight another army if we let it recruit. So... Hopefully they raise that army outside of Medhalan. Then we're going to hope that Medhalan, right, that army enters Medhalan and goes to recruit. Then we're going to siege the city. It's going to be a prolonged siege, right? You know, Medhalan's going to have well over 4,000 troops, right? That's what I said last episode. It's kind of what I'm saying this episode. So we're going to have to be kind of wary of that fact that they have so many troops and uh, go from there. Anyways... We uh, successfully captured the city center here, and all the arrow towers are neutral. So we're just going to line up our infantry in formation. We want to get them lined up as quickly as possible. And then we're going to line up our uh, backup infantry here, right? Our, basically our other line. And we're going to get ready for combat, because it looks like those two armies have linked up. Yeah, with them linked up, it's a massive force, right? It's probably going to be close to 6,000 men. A lot of men, right? So let's get our first battle group, right? Our Polybian, Principes, and Triarii in position. And then we'll line up our second battle group, our Pol uh, Camillan, Principes, and Triarii on the other side here. Like I said, we kind of want to avoid casualties in uh, Lucius Julius Libo's army, right? Uh, Legio 2, because I'm not sure if he's going to have to march immediately into Medhalan or not. If he does, we want to have as many, you know, troops available as possible so that we do not have to worry about uh, sitting in potentially, you know, our territory for too long and let him kind of rejuvenate his forces. Likewise, we do need him to sit in our territory for a couple turns to kind of restore public order, so it's a... Uh, there's no good way to really go about it. But, this is what we decided, or I decided. I saw an opportunity, and I took it. Our first battle group is all lined up, right? Our Polybian Principes and uh, Triarii are moving into position, so they're looking good. And uh, we're getting our second one lined up as we speak. The enemy's pretty much all lined up as it is, and it actually looks like they're starting to slowly move on me. But that's okay. I mean, what else was supposed to happen, right? At speed! We do... I don't want to say we outnumber them right now, but with those three cavalry units and the general off the board, that's probably 600-ish units we took out, so we're in good shape. We got the enemy marching on us right now, so we're actually going to get ready for combat. We're going to kind of tighten up our lines here. Yeah. Make them just a little bit deeper. Not much, right? Just a little bit. Alright, so our Polybian army is in position and waiting. Our Camillan army is also in position and waiting. And uh, our Triarii are very far away, unfortunately. So we're actually going to put our Camillan Triarii in reserve behind Legia 1. Now, there are a bunch of bowmen out front here, Celtic bowmen, 
So when they get in range and they start unleashing on me, I am going to charge forward with my Plebeian Legion. And then I'm going to have my Camillan Legion come in from the side. So Legio 2 is going to engage on the flank. And Legio 5 will engage directly. So we're just sitting here watching these bowmen. For when they get in position, they got to be close. But we're going to hold. Alright, they're close. So we're going to move up. And we're going to go on the offensive. So, Legio 5 is moving to intercept. Legio 2 is flanking. And my cavalry are currently moving to intercept as well. The uh, Legio 5 cavalry will be on the left flank. And the Legio uh, 2 cavalry will be on the right flank. Those bowmen have started attacking, but we are raining Pila down on them, and then we are going to give our charge orders here in a minute, once our Pila have gone out. Alright, let's do it. We're giving our orders. Charge! For the glory of Rome. Sure, our lines of contact are good here. Yeah, so as I thought, those bowmen are now fleeing backwards through their lines. That's kind of what you expected, right? Let's see how many units we have to flank. We have two units on the left side that can flank, and then we have. A bunch of units on the right that can play. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven units on the right that can flank. Those are just infantry units. Those aren't even our cavalry. Let's get our cavalry moving. So our cavalry on the right and on the left are moving. I'm going to bring my generals in close to inspire the troops. We're going to start sweeping in right now on the right side. Just a large sweeping envelopment maneuver. We're going to have our backup Triarii plug the gaps here. There's a couple gaps that showed up. So we're going to have them plug those gaps. Wasn't as bad as I thought. Lines of contact were pretty good. The gaps are actually very small. Some enemies already starting to shatter. So we're going to start chasing people down. We have three units that are shattered that are currently running for their life. We're going to keep sweeping in here. We're down to two units left that can sweep in. But it's, like I said, it's looking good. Line of contacts are good. Alright, that's it. We're out of Prinkapes on the right. So we have flanked with about everything we can. We're going to go ahead and get our Camillan cavalry lined up. And we're going to start doing cavalry charges here. Like I said, I'm going to avoid using our Bolivian cavalry just because they're heavily damaged. In a perfect world, I only want to spend two or three turns uh, rejuvenating our cavalry. I do not want to spend a large amount of time sitting in friendly territory. Looking good, looking good. Units are slowly shattering, right? 
not shattering as quickly as I like, but we have completely folded the enemy's left flank. Our right flank is just kind of running rampant here, which was the goal, right? One of our units has used all its ammunition. We had seven units come in on that right side, seven Princopes. So it would make sense that that's the side that was kind of heavy. Our right side was heavy, and our light side, or our left side was light. But, like I said, that's kind of how we, I don't want to say envisioned it, but that's kind of how we drew it up, right? And then as, uh, as enemy units route, more of my infantry uh, frees up, and we can send that infantry in to uh, do more damage, which is what we're doing now. We're going to just sweep in from the right to the left, and we're not even going to use our cavalry to really charge around. They're just going to start hunting down enemy units that are routing, because there's a lot of units routing right now, and pretty much all my cavalry is on the hunt. Alright, left looks good too. We're going to sweep in from the left now. I was surprised that uh, the left did as well as it did. And like I said, we're just sweeping along. This will be a much easier victory than I thought. Uh, the enemy general just throwing his own life away by not retreating with his men to a more advantageous position is kind of silly, but the AI is going to do what the AI so we have come across a couple units here that are not routing quickly. Some Veniti Extraordinary. So that makes sense. They are, I guess, Extraordinary Venetians. We're gonna try to keep our cavalry out of it. I did just charge them into a unit. The men are wavering. Out. Some men are wavering. I'm not sure where. Probably these men. Yeah. So those Venetian extraordinary are actually doing a bit of damage. We're gonna bring our uh, general in and have him execute a cavalry charge. One of our units has used all its ammunition. Those uh, Bolivian equites have charged down most of the enemy. So, so our right side is looking very well. But our left side is a little bit in trouble. Although we did force this Venetian Extraordinary, Veneti Extraordinary, to route. Pretty much they're all ready now, so the battle's gonna be over here probably in three, two, one, battle. It's a little early. I'm gonna continue the battle though, and hunt down the enemy. Because that's what we do. I do love getting a mass route going on. But there are a lot of uh, enemy units all over that need to be hunted down. I don't even know if we're going to actively be able to hunt them all down. There's so many of them. But, we're going to do the best we can. Uh, I am not going to speed it up three times just yet, because we are currently um, in the midst of hunting down way too many units. But the good news is my backup legion there, right? Legio 2, led by Lucius Julius Libo, sustained minimal casualties. There's only one unit in the yellow. However, my main legion, right, Legio 5, pretty much everyone is in the yellow. You got one unit in the red, and maybe a handful to a couple of units in the green. But overall, overall, we got kind of hammered there. But that was to be expected, right? We, we attacked an actual army full of professional soldiers, right? It wasn't a garrison force. Right, it was more reminiscent of those battles we had with Carthage early on in the region of Cosentia, right? When we were fighting real soldiers, right? We weren't fighting, you know, garrison troops. The garrison troops 
you know, they fold a lot easier than uh, regular army troops because their morale is lower, right? The, the way you recruit them, they're not, you know, a professional army. They're just garrison troops, and that's kind of how the game designs it. But we're going to keep, like I said, you just keep hearing me give orders. There's so many units running that I don't want to speed it up just yet. Also, I figure while we're here just hanging out, we are going to do our spotlight on both uh, Decimus and Marcus Junius Brutus. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a lot on them because every time I did, you came up with the uh, Marcus Junius Brutus that killed Caesar, right? That famous guy. Or we came up with other Junii family members. So, unfortunately, it's going to be a very light spotlight. And we're probably going to fall behind in our Punic War series, but I figured with uh, Legio V getting their first action here and kind of the transition from the Cornelii to the Junii family, right? Now that Carthage is on hold in the Punic Wars and we're switching our theaters, we might as well switch the, uh, the people that we look up. So we're going to switch those guys again. Pretty sure we got most everyone now. I'm looking. There's a couple cavalry units I have that aren't chasing the enemy down. Alright, I think we're good here. So we're gonna go ahead and go triple speed now. I think everyone's being successfully hunted down. Uh, but yeah, we are also not going to enslave the Venetians. So, first things first, we don't need any more slaves, right? We actually have a slave issue. I did come up with a solution to that though, so assuming we have enough time, I'm gonna revisit that. But the Venetians are technically, they were our friends for a good amount of time. So I don't want to enslave my friends, right? They they were friendly to me. You know, they might have, they, they didn't even declare war on me. I'm the one that's taking advantage of them now. So we're going to go ahead and ransom them back to the Venetians. We're not going to execute them. And we're not going to enslave them. We don't care if we give them an additional four or 5,000 manpower back, right? Because hopefully here, within about two years, we'll capture these last three Venetian cities they have. And we're just going to kind of gobble up the Venetians, right? Not their fault. It's just with the Venetians falling to the Lugos, I'd rather take the Venetians while they're weak than have to deal with the Lugos, but Medhalan will still be troublesome. Anyways, I'm content, so we're going to go ahead and quit the battle here. Decisive victory. There can be no doubt this is a great victory. The enemy are dead or running for their lives. So we're going to save the replay. We are on battle number 17. We actually fought the Venetians this time. We were in the territory of Pata, Vium, and uh, yeah, it was, what is it, 260 BCE. So that's it, pretty easy one, and we'll go ahead and save the replay and end the battle. Uh, very good. We deployed 7,000 men, right? Marcus Brutus, Marcus Junius Brutus, only 1,162 losses and 6,815 kills. Uh, Legio V, Cavalry had 292, 331, 131, 160, and 111 kills. We had some Principe units, 199, 267, 208, right? Good number of kills. And then some Triarii, 127, 183, 134, and 93 kills. So very good on our part. We'll take a look at our after action report here. So unfortunately, we did not get the main army to completely abandon. There was one unit of Hoplitae Optimi Venici that got away, 120 men. Otherwise, everyone else is dead, and the garrison force was completely dead. So they must have ran away, and I missed them. Honestly, not the worst outcome, because now this army is going to retreat to Patavium, which is probably better than having a new army being raised in Medhalan. So here is our after-action report. Rome deployed 7,000 men. We lost 1,162. We have 5,838 remaining with 5,526 kills and 1,289 men captured. The Venetians deployed 7,175 men. They lost 6,823. They have 352 remaining and 1,152 kills. So we're not going to execute them, right? That would have been 1,114 wealth, but that will anger anyone that likes them. And technically, they have some people to the north, the Nervi, that like them. So we don't want to do that. We could enslave them for 2,229 wealth, but like I said, we have too many slaves. So we're going to go ahead and ransom the captives. 
3,343 wealth gained from the defeated enemy. The enemy and their allies will look upon you more favorably if you ransom the captives from this battle. So, we ransomed them. And, uh, yeah. The new general went towards Pataviam. And he might not even be a general. He is a captain at the moment. Uh, Elixio. So, they're going to have to recruit a new general at some point. Now, because of that movement, I can no longer raid enemy territory. I'm kind of stuck here. And winter's coming up. So we're going to go ahead and move Legio 5, right, back into Ariminum. We're going to want them to kind of replenish their people. So we're going to have them use as much movement as possible to try to get back to their territory. Uh, we cannot take any stance but patrol, so that will be unhelpful. So we'll just leave Legio 2 and Legio 5 right next to each other and, uh, you know, hope that Nothing happens coming into winter. Like I said, I don't like having legions deployed in winter, but this was the decision I made, and that's that. So, with that, I'm kind of happy. We're actually going to zoom in here on the Venetian Theater instead of the uh, North African. And we're going to say farewell to turn 76, fall of 260 BCE. We do have 5,473 denarii in the treasury. That was from ransoming those captives. However, our per turn income did drop to 4,832 as opposed to that 7,500 because they're no longer raiding and we have 12 food. So without further ado, let's uh, go ahead and see what winter brings us. It will bring us uh, this year in history, so we'll have that to read. But let's see what Carthage and uh, the Venetians do. Those are the kind of the two people we're worried about now. Lots of fleet action between North Africa and Hispania. So it looks like Carthage is fortifying Hispania. Uh, two judges moved north from Syracuse on the island of Sicily, and it looks like they're approaching Magna Graecia, and that was it. Uh, an Arverni army marched into our territory and is right next to Genoa. That kind of scares me. The Arverni are supposed to be my friends, so why are they right next to Genoa? Also, if you can see, those of you that can't, the map was a little messed up there, but uh, we have multiple Apiro transport fleets sailing back to Illyria, right? Uh, multiple agents sailing back to Illyria, and the fleet is now back towards Illyria. So it looks like Epirus is successfully retreating, despite the fact that they seemed broken last time. They are now heading back to their territory to uh, play defense, I'm assuming. I haven't really given it much thought what I want to happen between Epirus and the Getai. I guess I'm actually kind of rooting for Epirus here. They can take a couple Getai territories, and then I take a Pyros. I could, you know, gobble up those territories, and I won't have to declare war on the Getai. But we'll see. Maybe I do declare war on the Getai, the Apulian, the Thinny, and abandon Hispania. Right? I haven't really thought about what I want to do. I'm one stage at a time. And stage one is the subjugation of the Venetians and the control of Medhalan, Patavium, and Norea. So, yeah. It's kind of where we're at right now. Uh, I don't plan to fight another battle this episode, but it is getting harder to predict what's going to happen. So, you never know what's going to happen. Alright, so unfortunately, faction joins your enemies. This faction has formed an alliance with your enemy, and this threatens you and strengthens your enemy, the Nervi. So remember, I wanted to kind of persuade them to be my friends, but now they've joined my enemies? I'll have to see what happened there. Return from mission, Menenia Graca. And then sabotage attempt, Cassica. Target was Septimus Nigidius Plancus. He is the new governor that we recruited in uh, Sicily, and the action was misdirection. So at least he's not trying to get assassinated, right? It was just misdirection. And then our hidden agent has been exposed, Mamemia Ahenobarba. All right, so that's it. Uh, welcome to turn 77. We are in a very chilly... Uh, winter of 269, 269, 259 BCE. So, you know, looking good, right? Um, we did kind of take an income hit, but that was going to happen, right? Because we're in winter. We'll go ahead and do our event messages for turn 77. War declared the Iceni and the Atrobates. 
So we have trade relations with both. We'll have to figure out what we potentially want to do there. And then another war declared the Arverni and the Dumnoni. Once again, we have relations with both of them. So we'll have to do diplomacy there. Hidden agent exposed. Cassica, that's the spy that's on Sicily. Then construction report. We built a military wharf in Carolus and grain pits in Cosentia. Trespasser. The Arverni. Remember, this faction has marched troops into your land without permission. That is the Champions of Rudianos, a 20 stack led by the King Oxteos, is just outside of Genoa, and they can capture that pretty easily if they wanted to. Other than that, we have this year in history, so we'll go ahead and stop our event messages for now and move on to our agents. So let's go see Opia Sevra. She's right next to the Druid Adgona. That's a Trevori Druid outside of Ibracte. But we're going to move Opia Sevra. We're going to get next to Octoduran. So we're going to get sight of Octoduran. That is the city northwest of Medhalan. But I do not see the Lugo's army. We can have her establish an intelligence network, so we're going to do that. The Lugo's army is actually in Medhalan. The Blood Swans, led by Ivo, is just west of Medhalan. They are fortified, but it, they don't look like they're going to my territory. I'm not sure. Uh, that's why they can't go on our territory. So if you click on the city of Medhalan, there's a giant red ring around it. And that red ring is kind of a no-go zone. The enemy can't move past that area, right? They can attack the city of Medhalan from there, but they can't walk past the city in that area. It's kind of like a area of denial. So the Blood Swans, led by Ivo, couldn't even get to Genoa if they tried. Now, the champions of Rudinos, led by Oxteos, the Arverni, they can get to Genoa. So we'll have to kind of figure out what we're going to do there. Looking at Mamemia Ahenobarba, I do want to keep eyes on Patavium. So we're going to go ahead and just move Legio 2 and 5 real quick to see how far we can get them. Can't get them very far, which you'd expect. We're going to get them both into Genoa for now. So Legio 5, we'll move Legio 2 first. Legio 2 will get into Genoa and Cisalpina. He'll get pretty far in. And then we're going to go ahead and have him patrol. And then Legio 5, we can't even make back to Ariminum, so we're going to have him also enter Genoan territory here. We're going to put him right on the border. And then we're going to have him enter a patrol stance as well. Unfortunately, I don't think either army can replenish because we're in winter, but that's okay. Uh, and then we do still have vision on Patavium, and it looks like the Mountain Men is led by Drekinos. A general. So they did recruit a new general, and he is outside of Patavium, which is good. So that actually turned out very well that we didn't massacre that entire army. Moving on to our governors. Marcus Picilius Scorus is administrating just south of Rome. Decimus Claudius Nepos is west of Terras. And now we have our new governor, Septimus Nigidius Plancus. We're going to put him just east of Syracuse. And we're going to go ahead and have him start administrating so he can spread uh, culture to Sicily and then give us some bonuses there, right? Pretty good. And then looking at Legio 3 while we're here, uh, we do have our veteran there, Marcus Cluelius Mergus. He's pretty close to leveling up. And then we still have a veteran over here in Legio 2. That should be Sextus Antonius Dento. I am thinking heavily about moving him into Legio 5. So our Equites actually have one gold chevron, meaning they're rank 7. I don't know how much more experience I really want to give to this legion. Our veteran might be better off helping out Legio 5. Fortunately, I can't, I don't think he can make it there this turn. So maybe next turn we do that, but we'll see. Just wait a minute and do it next time. Anyways, that handles our events and our agents. Let's go to our faction tab, see if it's on fire. Risk of Civil War, 1%, and Balanced Influence Rate in the Senate. That's good. 31% Julia, 16% Cornelia, 15% Junia, and 38% Apiria. So, pretty much par for the course. We do have 10,079 denarii. We're going to hold on to that for now and skip our buildings, and then go to our armies. We do have an issue here in Legio 1. They are under attrition. So it says, disease brings death and suffering to our troops. 
We must appease the gods through sacrifice for the offense we have caused. And it says winter region attrition. Cut off from the supply lines during winter. Starvation. The region does not offer enough food to forage during winter. This leads to starvation for unprepared armies. Plus 10% attrition, minus 30% campaign map movement range, minus 5% melee attack skill for all units, and minus 15% morale for all units. So I didn't realize what happened, but I guess now I'm realizing it. If your army is in enemy territory for too long raiding and it's winter, they don't have the supply chain, right? The baggage train, so they suffer attrition. So we're going to go ahead and try to take him out of our raiding stance and see if we can move him. Unfortunately... For whatever reason, Legio 1 cannot be moved. He is stuck. So we'll just put him back into a raiding stance because we don't have anything else to do. And they'll have to suffer attrition next turn. So minor mistake there on my part for Legio 1 and Decimus Junius Brutus and Sega Stika, but live and learn, right? Uh, while we're here, just to give you a quick what's up, that Apuli army, the Heralds of Death, led by Senna, is besieging Norea. So we'll have to see how that turns out. If the Apuli take Norea, we might be declaring war on the Apuli sooner rather than later. We'll see, because Norea is mine for the taking. Uh, we already handled Legio 5 and Legio 2. That brings Genoa up to minus 82 plus 30. So we're actually going to take Lucia's Papyrus Cursor, move him out of Genoa and see what that does. It goes from a plus 30 to plus 22, which is still good. And we're going to actually move Legio 4 into Latium and have him patrol Latium. First of all, it'll give us a huge income boost in Latium, right, from a patrolling army. But second, we will go down to minus 4 public order per turn in Latium. So overall, I think that's our best choice. Looking at Legio 6, led by Lucius Cornelius Scipio on Corsica at Sardinia. Still patrolling just north of Carolus, and then... Classes S1 is there. I guess I forgot to do anything with Classes S1, so we're just leaving him kind of outside of the Port of Carolus for now. I would have him raid Carthaginian territory, but like I said, I really don't want to get into any battles. So we'll go ahead and have Legi or Classes S1 actually sail on over towards uh, Syracuse for now, right? Because he's supposed to be a screening force for Syracuse. So we'll move him over there. Technically, he doesn't need to be anymore because the Epirotes are in full retreat back to their territory. So I think Syracuse is more than safe from any enemy actions. But we'll keep Classes as one close to Syracuse just in case. And then Legio 3, led by Maeus Cornelius Scipio Assina, is patrolling on Sicily. Classes 2 and 3 are both patrolling and they both seem good. So we're going to leave them there. Like I said, I think they're close enough to the coast and they're not out the ocean that they don't need supplies. So we're good. That handles our armies and navies. So let's check out our campaign map real quick. So over in the Gallic Theater, right? Well, the only thing that worries me is we had the champions of Rudianos, led by the King Oxteos, march into my territory and is now right outside of Genoa. So that is a little bit of a concern. Also north of Genoa, just west of Medhalan, is the Blood Swans, led by Ivo, the High King. So I think he's stuck there. He can't get to Genoa. And he's too weak to take Medhalan, so he's just stuck. And then, like I said, we had Legios 2 and 5 retreat from Venetian territory. They're currently patrolling in Genoa. They really can't be attacked by anyone, so they're safe to patrol. And then we have uh, the Heralds of Death, led by Cinna. That's the Apuli, sieging down Norea. And then remember, Legio 1, led by Decimus Junius Brutus, is suffering attrition in Sega Stika. So that kind of handles our... I'm going to change it to the Alps, right? Our Alps theater. So we have Gaul, we have the Alps, and now we have our Greek theater. So far, uh, the Epirotes have not lost any cities. They still have Dalminium, Epidamnos, Apollonia, and Larissa. But if you do recall, the Getai have Singidon and Nysos. They kind of border Dalminium and Epidamnos. And then they do have another city past Zarmezagusta and Pelendava, but I'm not sure where it is. So the Epirotes should pretty handily kick the Getai out. Then hopefully by the time they kick the Getai out, I'll be nearby to swoop in and then attack a depleted Apiro force. We'll see, but that's the plan. Uh, looking at Sicily, we do have uh, two, three enemy judges, right? Three Carthaginian judges still on the island, plus Cassica, that's the enemy Massa Cecily scout, but she's only three authority, three cunning, three zeal, so she can't do much. Uh, 
don't know where Abby Ball is, so hopefully she doesn't land on the island and try to murder Septimus Nigidius Plancus. And then in North Africa, not much is happening. You have a uh, couple sages for the Mass of Sicily. I think those are the equivalent of judges, as well as an enemy warlord. Then we have those two Mass of Sicily armies, as well as one Carthaginian army just hanging out on North Africa. So yeah, that handles all of our campaign theaters. Let's go to diplomacy here. We're going to have to do a lot of diplomacy. So first of all, we're going to do what we can with the Arverni here. The Arverni, we have... They condemn treaties with the Domnoni, minus 16. So we're going to have to go up to the Domnoni here and cancel our treaty with them, our trade agreement. A flapping tongue that speaks without wisdom is not welcome. Be like a spear and have a point. <laughs> so we just canceled our trade agreement. Our traders will look elsewhere for wealth and trouble you no more. Have yours. And then we're going to cancel our non-aggression pact. We will respect your words. Our warriors are mighty men, though, and your enemies will be sharpening their swords. So the reason I did that is because if you look at the uh, diplomatic map here, right, for those of you that can't see, you just have to follow along. The Arverni heavily border the two or three, it looks like two provinces that the uh, Dumnoni have. The Dumnoni have the region of Lemanon and the region of Namnitum. So I expect the Arverni to take those pretty quickly because the Arverni are only at war with the Domnani. And then we pretty much lost that modifier, right? We only have a minus 10 for pra uh, past treaties with the Domnani. Now, unfortunately, we also got hit with a minus 9 for war with the Nervi. So it looks like the Nervi did declare war on us. Just looking at that real quick, they did. The Nervi are at war with the Tulingi, the Iceni, Rome, the Kimbros, and the Domnani. So unless the Kimbros take them out, that's not good. That's kind of ruining how the Nervi were supposed to be our uh, northern bulwark. They are a minus 107 too, so I don't know how to really, you know. Gods of the afterlife, spare my ass. Well, why do you trouble my digestion today? I'm going to try to send a peace treaty, but... Nope. I cannot stomach your cowardice. Your people will have peace when they are all stacked on the funeral pyres. I'm not sure why they declared war on me. Like I said, they liked the Venetians, but they didn't have any alliance with the Venetians. The good news is I'm back to being trustworthy, and it's in the yellow. So maybe a couple more turns, and I'll actually be reliable. Anyway, scrolling back to the Arverni, we've done pretty much everything we can to patch up our relations with them. We're plus 52, so that's pretty good. Uh, the Vivisi, we are plus 64 with. Uh, they're at war with Lusotana, so I'm thinking we just declare war with Lusotana right away because, you know, I guess why not? I mean, we won't do it. No need to burn that bridge just yet, but the Lusotana in control, I'm going to say two-thirds of Iberia. I think they only are missing one, two, three, four cities. So, yeah, but they are weak. They're weaker than the Arverni, and they're much weaker than me, so... Arverni kind of recovered uh, our public order, but just looking at Rome, we're friends with the Arverni, the Vavisi, and the Ossetani. Uh, the Atrabates have kind of diminished with us. That is because of uh, our past treaties with the Dimnone and then our current treaties with the Iceni. I am going to keep our trade agreement with the Iceni for now, just because I'm not quite sure what's happening there. But uh, the Venetians hate me. And the Nervi hate me, and the Kimbros and Lugos hate me. Uh, Apyro still loves me. I don't know why. And then you got the Thinny, the Getai, and the Puli are kind of neutral to just barely neutral positive with me. So I think that's about all I can do diplomacy-wise. Like I said, at least try to keep the Arverni happy. Hopefully by doing that, they'll leave you my territory. Us. There is food enough for two armies awaiting us when we have talked. I'm going to send a non-aggression pact. Rejected. Our gods whisper to me that I must reject your offer. Worthy though it was, and hope for something more. Unfortunate, but life, you know, I think that's good for now. I'll just leave it at that. Like I said, if, if this Arverni army, right, the champions of Rudinos, led by Oxteos, attacks Genoa, so be it. I can't do anything to stop it right now. I can't get an army over there, so... That's just 
the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. Anyways, that's diplomacy. We do have, like I said, that massive 10,079 denarii in our treasury. So we're going to look at Latium first. I kind of want to work on Latium here. And right now, the only thing left to build is this public forum. And it would be a war horse pens. But we don't have the war horse resource. That's my issue. And looking at the tactical map, so I'm going to try to find where is the war horse resource. Strategic overview. Do we see a war horse icon anywhere? Because if we do, that's where I want to go or want to get a trade agreement. The Dumnoni have war horses. It's in Lebanon, though, so with any luck, the Arverni will take that and we'll get war horses there. So we're going to be banking on the Arverni to take Lebanon. Now, the reason I did want to focus on Latium and then Magna Gratia here is because they do have these two really beefy governors that are giving us minus construction costs. So we're going to kind of build there first and then branch out if we have to. Probably we'll build in Carolus too, because we don't plan to put a governor there. But we won't build in other territories until we have to. So what's up in Magna Gratia would just be the sacred grove to the grove of nymphs. So we'll go ahead and do that. What is the grove of nymphs? Well, that's the third stage, right? The spirits know much and will speak to the devout. The description is the same as a sacred grove, so our change is we're going to go from plus 4 to plus 8 public order per turn, so that's a plus 4 gain. Plus 4 to plus 6 sanitation, that's a plus 2 gain. Minus 6 to minus 8% regional income, taxes for building upkeep, that's minus 2%. Plus 3 to plus 4 Latin cultural influence, that's plus 1. Then 0.6 to 0.8% percent first and second class citizens. So for 10 turns and 3,960 denarii, let's go ahead and send that Grove of Nymphs. Now, looking at our politics tab, the Gens Cornelia is semi disloyal. So, we're going to look at sending a lovely lady out here to organize games somewhere. It is only 1,196 denarii, and we're going to send it to. We're going to send it to Corsica at Sardinia for now. They're minus 71 and falling. So, 1,196. We just sent Ionia Calva to Corsica at Sardinia, kind of restore order there. Leaves us with 4,923 denarii. Like I said, I'm going to avoid building on Sicily for now. Even though Sicily has a potential to make a lot of money, uh, there's a lot of stuff still building there. And then our governor hasn't really leveled up. So once he levels up and gets uh, some bonuses, then we'll probably go on a rampage there. Now, remember, Corsica at Sardinia will not be getting a governor. So anything we build here, we might as well just go ahead and full send, right? So what we need to focus on, once again, is public order. Public order, and then uh, I want to grow the population. So for that, I actually am going to upgrade the consecrated ground. And I'm going to upgrade the consecrated ground to a shrine, shrine, shrine of Mars. Behold, the god of war marches before us. So what does the shrine of Mars give us? Plus two public order per turn, plus four sanitation, Plus one experience ranks for Roman infantry recruits, right? You're seeing that bonus already trickling for infantry. Plus 2% melee defense skill for all units in the local province, right? Don't need it. Minus 6% regional income, taxes for building upkeep. Plus two Latin cultural influence. Plus two security against zealous agent actions, zeal bonus, and plus 0.5% first and second class. So you can see there we're already getting a good first and second class bonus plus experience for our recruits. So who is Mars, right? Mars was the second most potent god in the Roman pantheon after his father, Jupiter. War was at the heart of Roman imperialism, and its governing deity, Mars, was crucial to the state's expansionist ideals. He was rightly, greatly revered and worshipped. A whole month, March, was put aside for his festivals, marking the beginning of the Roman year. Father of Romulus and Remus, Mars was associated with the very birth of Rome, and thus Romans saw themselves as his children. Octavian built a temple to Mars rather than Jupiter on the capital in Rome to celebrate the overthrowing of Julius Caesar's murderers. The Roman army believed Mars marched before them, so homage had to be paid to ensure success in battle. I'm a big fan of Mars too, so yeah, let's build this shrine of Mars. It's going to cost us... Uh, 2,243 denarii, and it's going to take six turns, but let's do it.
Uh, with that, we have 2,680 denarii left, and we can actually upgrade the aqueduct. So if you remember, we talked about the aqueduct last time. We're not going to go with the Cloaca Maxima, right? That's going to go into Rome. And then the Vigilis Urbani is actually more of a agriculture thing. So we'll build that in our agriculture territory. So we're going to go from the aqueduct to the fountains. Fountains are beautiful, practical, and above all, very, very civilized. We're going to go from plus four to plus six public order per turn for a plus two. We're going to go from plus one growth per turn to no growth per turn. So we will lose one growth per turn. We're going to go from plus four to plus six sanitation, gaining two sanitation. And then we're going to go minus 2% to minus 5% regional income. That's taxes for the building upkeep. And then we're going to go uh, plus 3 to plus 4% unit replenishment. That's 2 more or 1% more unit replenishment. And then we're going to gain plus 4 Latin cultural influence. So from 0 to plus 4. Then from plus 0.1% to plus 0.1% first class citizens. No gain, but we're also going to gain 0.5% second class citizens. So a little bit about the fountains. To Romans, fountains were much more than mere civic decorations. As part of the most complex water distribution system in the ancient world, they were a mark of Roman civilization and technological superiority. After the excavation of Pompeii, destroyed by the explosions of Mount Vesuvius in 79 CE, many fountains were found preserved by ash. They were placed throughout the city, enjoyed by the citizens and slaves alike. In Rome, the writings of Council Sextus Julius Frontius mention that there were 30 grand fountains throughout Rome by 98 CE and nearly 600 public basins. Pressure to drive the water up and out was achieved through clever use of gravity and different sizes of lead piping. Pliny the Younger describes one household where the fountains sprayed their water only when the guests sat down to dinner on their ingeniously designed seats. So there you go, a little bit about fountains. So for uh, 2,243 denarii in six turns, let's build some fountains. And that just about bankrupts us. We're down to 437 denarii in the treasury. And uh, yeah, that's it. Can't move anyone else. We did pretty much everything we need to. So before we end it, let's look at this year in history. And uh, it's a short one, which is nice. We have the Roman consuls, right? This year in history, 259 BCE, L. Cornelius L. F. Scipio, so that's Lucius Cornelius Scipio, and C. Aquilius Florus. The Athenian archon is Philonus. In the Seleucid Empire, the Seleucid king Antiochus II starts the Second Syrian War against Ptolemy to avenge his father's losses. Antiochus II finds a willing ally in Antigonus II Gonatas, the king of Macedonia, who has been dealing with Ptolemy II's attempts to destabilize Macedonia. So if you recall, remember Ptolemy was supporting both Sparta and Athens. Eventually, you know, Antigonus II of Macedon did kind of put them in their place. But these two are kind of teaming up, these two successor kingdoms, because Ptolemy's been a pain to them. Then in Sicily, the Carthaginians under Hamilcar take advantage of their victory at Thermae in Sicily by counterattacking the Romans and seizing Enna. Hamilcar continues south to Camarina in Syracusan territory to try to convince the Syracusans to rejoin the Carthaginian side. So unfortunately, the game is getting a little bit ahead of us. I don't think we've covered that, but I'll think about maybe doing a Punic War installment next time. It all depends if I take a city, right? Because if I take a city, uh, well... And I kind of want to talk about that city. Anyways, that handles this year in history. Uh, we'll do our spotlight next turn. So without further ado, let's focus in here on Cisalpina. And uh, yeah, we'll say farewell to turn 77, winter of 259 BCE. We have 437 denarii in the treasury. We are up to 5,202 denarii per turn. That's actually more than we had last turn, and we have 11 food. So with that, let's end it and see what uh, Carthage and the Arverni and the Venetians do. Hopefully, with that declaration of war, the Arverni leave our territory. Lots of more Carthaginian fleets sailing between Iberia and North Africa, and that Carthage army in the city of Carthage took off towards Carolus. So I am a little bit worried that... Our wise women had looked into the flame, 
and see no good coming from trade with you. So the Arverni have ended their trade agreement with me. That makes me sad, even though we have a plus 45 relationship. They did not declare war on me, though. So I did lose that trade agreement, which is big money, especially because I canceled the trade agreement with the Dumnoni. Not sure what to do, right? It just happens. I can't really squeeze any more love out of the Arverni, and now I've lost access to war horses. So, unfortunate. But, such is life. These things happen. I was hoping by doing that, things would go well. Maybe if I declared war on the Dumnoni, they would have been more likely to like me. So maybe I do that next turn. I'll declare war on the Dumnoni and step it up a notch. There's no reason why I shouldn't have. Maybe that was an oversight on my part, but I thought just canceling the agreements would be enough. Maybe it would have been if the Nervi didn't declare war on me, but hindsight's twenty twenty, right? I guess diplomatically, I'll have to be a little bit more aggressive than I want to be. Right, I didn't want to burn my bridge with the Domnoni just yet, but I guess we're going to burn it. Only the greatest dare speak of peace to their enemies. Only the weak seek the death of all. So the Venetians want a peace treaty. I do not want a peace treaty with them, right? So I'm just going to go ahead and deny it. Sorry, I rejected it. I find but scant meat stuck to your bony words. We have nothing more to talk about. Sorry, buddy. I love you, but I need your territory. Trade agreement broken with the Arverni. Your relationship with this faction has deteriorated, and they have ended trade relations with you. Welcome to turn 78. We are in a beautiful spring of 259 BCE. Unfortunately, we are making less money this turn than last turn, probably because of our broken trade agreements, but that's life. Then Desertion, Legio 1, Region Sagastica, we lost 350 men from attrition. Increase in rank, Mamemia Ahenobarba, she's gone to rank 6. Uh, Decimus Claudius Nepos, the governor, has gone to rank 8. Marcus Achilles, this governor, also to rank 8. And then Mission Issued, Military Organization. The Senate lauds your efforts to advance Rome's military potential, but feels that we would benefit from the further development of military organization. Research of technology in the following category. Tactics. And then we'll get war fervor for four turns. That's plus 5% morale for all units. Well, we can consider it, right? Uh, before I do anything, I want to go to my diplomacy. The Arverni are still friendly with me, so we're going to go to the Domnoni. Right? And declare war just I right away. I have little gain in wasting the day on you. What you say had better please my ears. By the gods, we have war. Sound the horns, sharpen the swords. You, pray to your foul gods. So, we declared war on them. Let's go and re-talk to the Arverni. Uh, that did bounce us up to plus 62. Uh, and see if... Good and noble friend. What an honor my you trade do agreement. us. Come speak so that the spirits can hear your words. Nope. You have an honest tongue, and so I reject your offer hesitantly and without wishing offense. Unfortunate. Um, didn't work. I'm not sure this might be silly. They don't like the Lusotannins either. So I'm going to go ahead and declare war on the Lusotannins while I'm here, right? Speak quickly and well. Speak ill or slowly, and I may feed your tongue to the dogs. Unfortunately, our rating did drop back down to unreliable, and it's in the red, so I'm not sure what I did there, but I did something. Whoa, it shall be. We are honest folk, and prefer the sharp sword to a lying tongue. So there's war with the Lusotannins. Did that affect our relationship with the Arverni at all? Nope, we're still just plus 62, so didn't gain anything with that. Not much to happen. I do wish the Nervi would go and have peace with me. Speak quickly and well. Speak ill or slowly and I may feed your tongue to the dogs. No peace. Peace! Be grateful I do not have your peaceful tongue ripped from your head. Well, unfortunately, that didn't work. Uh, I did kind of go out of order there because I really wanted my, uh, my diplomacy to work out, but it didn't. Anyways, let's get back to uh, turn 78 and do things how we're supposed to. We'll check out our event messages. 
a faction rises, the Gondofarid dynasty. They are all the way over in India, it looks like, so nothing really important to me. Construction complete, a Roman village in Panormos, that's the Roman village of fish. Unseasonal conditions, a late spring in Latium, that is negative. Unhappy populace in Cisalpina, that is actually technically a good thing. Faction destroyed, Maria Samjaria. Don't know who they are. Troubled populace in Sicilia. That's actually a good thing. And then we had our desertion and our hidden agent exposed, Cassica. We also didn't even go over our culture order income last time, so I'll have to do that maybe this time? We'll see. I am trying to go a little bit faster and maybe do that every other turn now, but I enjoy doing it. Uh, increase in rank, Memia Ahenobarba. So let's go ahead and level her up. We're going to upgrade her default skill, Explorator. Few have seen the furthest reaches of the world and return to tell the tale. Plus 10 to plus 15 line of sight. Plus 10 to plus 15% campaign map movement range for the accompanying general. And then minus 10 to minus 15% success chance of enemy agent actions. Military intelligence. We're also going to go ahead and upgrade infiltration. Not all doors need keys. Plus 5 to plus 10 line of sight. And plus 5 to plus 10% chance of successfully launching an ambush in the local region while deployed. And then lastly, we're just going to go ahead and upgrade Spy. Uh, watching is a skill that all men have, but few appreciate. Plus 2 to plus 3 cunning, and plus 10 to plus 15% chance of evading enemy agents. And that finishes her upgrade. We'll go on and bop on down to uh, Marcus Caecilius Scorus now. He's just outside of Rome. I'm going to go ahead and upgrade Paragon. A learned man will always have the people's best interest at heart. Plus 10 to plus 15% research rate. Plus 4 to plus 6 public order. Plus 2 zeal. We didn't have any zeal before. Then plus 1 experience gained by the general of the parent army per turn zeal based. That one doesn't really matter, but the extra research rate in public order is nice. We're also going to go into uh, export specialist. Bringing our quality goods to the world is the key to prosperity. Plus 10 to plus 15% wealth from all commerce in the local province. Commercial Stimulation Edict, plus 10 to plus 15% wealth from all commerce buildings in the local province. And then we're going from plus 0 to plus 2 cunning. So we're just going to get a flat cunning bonus. And then lastly, we're going to go into Expert Supervisor. This man has learned the craft of governance well. Minus 10 to minus 20% chance of success of enemy agent actions against the parent army or general. Sadly, not really good, but minus 1 to minus 2% Empire Maintenance. And remember, he has filled out all 10 of his skills, and those are pretty much all the important skills. Everything's pretty much leveled, so the next couple levels won't really matter. We just need to finish um, Administrator, Economist, and Public Orator. That's the base authority, uh, cunning, and zeal traits. And then we have Industrialist here, which doesn't really matter because we don't have any industry buildings in Latium. Moving on to Decimus Claudius Nepos, we are also going to upgrade Paragon, right? We already talked about that. That's basically the research rate in public order. But we're going to upgrade a farming expert. For every seed that is planted, our culture's prosperity increases. Plus 4 to plus 6 food, plus 4 to plus 6 growth per turn in the local province, and then plus 2 cunning, we had none. Then we're also going to go to level 2 of expert supervisor. That's just the extra empire maintenance. So... We did gain a little bit, right? We're up to 5,073 denarii per turn, but not the big increase like I wanted, unfortunately. So with that, our event messages are handled. Let's go to our spies here. So we are going to move Opia Severa a little bit closer here. I'm going to kind of put her on the border so I have a better chance of seeing both Octoduron and Medhalan. And we're going to leave her there. She can't deploy. We can see that the Blood Swans, right, led by Ivo the High King, is currently besieging Medhalan, and the general unit there has only 115 men, and then a couple of his spearmen units are pretty injured, and then his cavalry is pretty injured, so I'm not sure what he's thinking, but he's thinking something. And then we're going to leave Mamemia Ahenobarba right where she is. She's giving us good enough vision of both uh, Patavium and Norea that I'm happy there. We can see that the mountain men led by Drekanos has not started recruiting, and they're just northeast of Patavium. Uh, we did our governors, right? So Marcus Caecilius Scorus, he still is administrating south of Rome. And then uh, Decimus Claudius Nepos is west of Terrace. They're going to have quite a while before they level up 
They are currently 450 out of 576, so it's going to be a while. And then Septimus Nigidius Plancus is still safe in Sicily. It looks like he wasn't harassed, so that's good. And then I'm going to assume my veterans are doing okay. Like I said, we're going to kind of start skipping a few things to just kind of get through this a little bit quicker. Uh, with that, though, I am going to move the veteran from Legio 2. So that's Sextus Antonius Dento. I'm actually going to move him out of the army, right, of Legio 2, and I'm going to put him in Legio 5 so he can execute military training there. Like I said, I talked about this before. Our Equites already are rank 7. That's one gold chevron. And our weakest units are rank 4. That's one silver chevron. So Legio 2 is pretty experienced. We can just let a new, basically, army get experienced. With that, we are going to take Legio 2 out of a patrol stance, and we're going to move him. We're going to see here. So that Arverni army did vacate the territory of Genoa. So despite the fact that they canceled our trade agreement, they did leave. So that's good. And we're going to have him move pretty much as close to Medhalan as possible. So he's going to move through the forest just north of Genoa, and he's going to move to the border of Genoa and Medhalan. I'm not sure if Ivo can attack me. Once again, I am a little bit worried, so we are going to... We can't go in a fortify stance. He can patrol, but patrolling is too risky. So we're going to leave Legio 2, led by Lucius Julius Libo, not in a stance there. And uh, that's all we'll do for now, right? We're technically on our agents, so we'll quit skipping around, right? Don't want to skip too bad. Go to that faction tab, 0% chance of civil war, and balance influence rate in the Senate. So I'm happy. Buildings, we have 5,125 denarii gonna skip for now uh, I'm gonna see if our modifier wore off anywhere and it were wore off in Illyricum so we are gonna have to send a lovely lead to Illyricum we're gonna send Aria Calvina of the Gens Junia it will cost us 1196 denarii so I like how it's still cheap and we'll send her to organize games in Illyricum dropping us down to 3929 denarii Looking at our armies, uh, Legio 1 is back to not suffering attrition. So it looks like that was just for being there in winter. So we are going to continue to have him raid in the spring and the summer. And then in the fall, it looks like we'll move him back in the fall before he suffers attrition. So we're going to let him just keep raiding in Sega Stika, right? Keep raiding that Lugos territory and uh, making sure we get a good amount of money there, right? Because if we have him return, we're going to lose that bonus for raiding. Looking at Legio 5, led by Marcus Junius Brutus, we can take him out of a patrol stance, but he can't march anywhere. So we can either put him in pretty much any stance we want here. Patrol region will give us a plus 4% replenishment. Fortify will give us plus 4% as well. There's no army that can attack us, so we'll just stay in the patrol stance here, and that'll give more uh, public order back to Genoa. Just looking at our most damaged unit, we have a 77-man Princope here. Unfortunately, that's going to be seven turns until it's fully replenished. So he's kind of stuck here replenishing for a bit. But that's not bad. I don't really want to take Pat to VM right now. I do need to wait a couple more turns to let the public order in Genoa and Cisalpina even out. But more importantly, I got my eyes on Medhalan here. So the minute that the Blood Swans, led by Ivo... Right, of the Lugos take Medhalan, I'm going to attack the next turn, right? You're going to have a severely weakened army in there. I might be able to catch them off guard. We'll see, right? It's kind of TBD at the moment, but that would be a really good opportunity for me. We're also going to leave Legio 4, led by Lucius Papyrus Cursor, just patrolling in Latium. It's right on the border with uh, Genoa and Cisalpina, just in case I need to kind of have him scoot back in. But he's going to stay in Latium. Then you have Legio 6, led by Lucius Cornelius Scipio, on Corsica et Sardinia. And then you have Legio 3, led by Gnaeus Cornelius Scipio, on Sicily. Looking at our navies, we have Classicist 1 here, right? Not much to really do. We have the Lions of Tanit. They are on the sea here, just uh, west of Sicily. They currently can't attack Carolus or Legio 3. They can, it looks like, potentially attack one of the cities. I'm not sure. I'm a little worried, though, so I'm going to put Legio 3 into a fortify stance. Just because I, I do get a little worried. 
but it looks like we're safe so far. Carolus is covered by Legio 6, and Panormos and Agragos is covered by Legio 3. So we'll have Classes as 1 just go on down here and make sure that they're covering uh, Syracuse. So we have all of our bases covered. We do have three more turns at sea before we have to replenish, so we're good. And then we'll have Classes S1 just patrol here, right south of Syracuse. So yeah, all that's handled. We'll take a look at our campaign map. Gaul still looks good, right? The Arverni are moving out. I'm assuming they're going to move on the Domnoni, who control Lemanon, and then probably up there in that other territory, the Namnetum. Uh, the Wode Warriors, led by the Domnoni, have sacked Iliobana. That's an Atrabati city, and they look like they're raiding outside their territory. So interesting to see what happens there. It looks like the Atrabates also lost a few of their armies. Um, looking elsewhere in the Alps, not much to handle. Like I said, you have the Blood Swans, led by Ivo, besieging Medhaland. And then uh, the Mountain Men, led by Drekanos, just kind of moved northeast of Patavium. And the Heralds of Death, led by Cinna, that's the Apuli, are still besieging Norea. And over in the Greek theater, no changes. Uh, Apyro still controls all their cities, and the Getai still control all of theirs. Then looking on Sicily, we did have uh, one judge move on to Magna Gratia, and then that mercenary veteran is still deployed there, so a couple issues. And then North Africa, remember we had the lines of Canet led by Harmatius leave the port and is sailing now in the Mare Africum either towards Carolus or I don't know where, somewhere. He's sailing somewhere, that's all I know. That Athenian fleet is still outside of Terrace. I don't know what it's doing, it hasn't left yet, so it's just hanging out there. Yeah, that covers our campaign map. Uh, our diplomacy was pretty much done too. I did that at the beginning of the turn because I got a little jumpy. I do want to check my trade and finance real quick. We are down to 3,868 denarii per turn. I'm going to open up diplomacy just real quick. Greetings, friend. I've called for good ale to ease your throat and, ha, ah, ripe women to ease other parts. So he calls me friend, but he doesn't want to do a trade agreement. Makes me sad. I don't know what else to do to get the Arverni to like me. So I would like to stop having more with the Nervi, but the Nervi won't won't go for it. So we're just going to sit at this and uh, cry a little bit. Uh, we are going to do a roundup, right? Culture order. Probably skip income just because uh, uh, you don't need income just yet. Um, Iadir, right? Located in Illyricum. Currently minus 41 with minus 2. Minus 10 from cultural differences, minus 7 from taxes, and minus 11 from slaves. So not bad, right? Not good, but not bad. Uh, we are 42.0% Latin, losing 0.3% next turn. Good news is when we do go on the offensive against the Pyros, right? Latin is dominant. Looking at Genoa and Cisalpina, we are negative 60 plus 23. That's primarily from having uh, Lucius Julius Libo in the territory. We have uh, negative 6 from cultural differences, negative 7 from taxes, and negative 13 from slaves. Slave population still is pretty high at 77.1%, but better than the 84% we had a little while ago. And we are 37.3% Latin, losing 0.2% next turn. Germanic is actually on the rise because of Ivo being in the area. And then looking at Corsica at Sardinia, remember we did games here, uh, we are minus 62 plus 13, minus 11 from cultural differences, minus 7 from taxes, minus 11 from slaves, and we still have minus 4 from provincial instability. We are 43.6% Latin with a 0.9% move next turn. And then looking at Saracusai, right? We are, let's see here, minus 49 with a plus 9 next turn. Minus 12 from cultural differences, minus 7 from taxes, minus 10 from slaves, and we still have minus 3 from provincial instability. 31.7% Latin with a 1.5% move next turn. So one less Carthaginian judge plus my own governor means big Latin movement. In Magna Gratia, we are minus 1 with minus 6. Uh, very sad. We are minus 4 from cultural differences, minus 7 from taxes, minus 9 from slaves. And then, like I said, we have Carthalon here. He's basically giving minus 8 from public order. 77.2% Latin, losing 0.2% next turn. I think Punic is unfortunately on the rise now that they have a judge there. 
and then in Latium we are 24 at 0, so we are stable. We are uh, 70, well, what's our modifiers there? Minus 4 from cultural differences, minus 7 from taxes, and minus 10 from slaves. 76.3% Latin with a minus 0.2% next turn. So that handles our roundup. Before we end it, I do want to kind of give away a little secret here. And it's not a secret, but it's something that I'm going to do. So we have two edicts to play with in four provinces. So if you recall, we have Corsica at Sardinia and Sicily under Bread and Games. In Corsica at Sardinia, we're getting plus six. And in Sicily, we are getting plus 12. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to change these edicts to sell slaves. So the first thing you need to know is that in spring, we have a minus 5% wealth from agriculture modifier. But in summer and fall, we get positive modifiers. So by selling slaves, if you recall, it's minus, or plus 1% empire maintenance, plus 10% piracy penalties in the local sea region, plus 100% wealth generated by slaves, plus two public order from luxuries, minus 15% slave population over time, and minus two slave unrest. So the TLDR here is our slave populations are too high and it's contributing too much negative public order. So by selling slaves, we'll lose 15% slaves per turn. So if we have this on for both summer and fall, that's minus 30% slaves, and we get a huge wealth bump in the months where we generate the most agriculture income. It's a win-win. So basically every spring, we're going to sell slaves, right? Remember, sell slaves doesn't activate till next turn. So this turn, they will still have bread and games. And then every fall, we're going to go back to bread and games, right? Because it won't activate till the winter. So we're going to go ahead and switch it. We're going to sell slaves in Corsica at Sardinia. And we're going to go ahead and sell slaves in Sicily. In Sicily, our slave population is 56%, right? A little bit too high. And in Corsica at Sardinia, it's 60.7%. Ideally, we want to get our slave population around 25 to 30%. That should be more acceptable for the public order. So with that, I'm happy with turn 78. We do have a little bit of Denari here, right? 3,929. So we're gonna go ahead and look at what we can upgrade in Carolus. And I think what we're gonna upgrade is the Village of Iron. So what's the Village of Iron? Well, it's a village that provides iron. We're gonna go from five iron to 15 iron. We're going to go from no food loss to losing two food. We're going to go from plus 1 to plus 2 growth per turn, plus 1 to plus 2 squalor, 168 to 338 wealth from manufacturing, then minus 2 to minus 4% land recruitment costs, then 0.1% first, second, and third class citizens to 0.5% first, second, and third class citizens. All those will benefit this island, right? Our recruitment hub. So for 3,386 denarii in six turns, let's get that Roman village of iron going. And uh, that's it. That pretty much bankrupts us. We're down to 543 denarii. So we're going to go ahead and focus in on the Venetian area here, right? The Just south of the Alps, I guess, the Po River Valley. And we're going to end it. So I'd like to wave farewell to turn 78, spring of 259 BCE. We have 543 denarii in the treasury. We are set to make 4,866. That's just a small loss from last turn. And then we have 15 food, which is four more than last turn. So with that, let's go ahead and end it and see what Carthage does, right? The lines of Tanit in the ocean. We'll see what the Lugos do, right? The blood swans to Medhalan. All right, so that Carthaginian transport fleet just sailed really close to Carolus, but did not land. And there's a couple more fleets moving around there. So definitely interesting. They might be trying to move on Carolus. So I might deploy Classicus 1 to Carolus next turn. A couple judges moved on Sicily. We see that there's a navy, a full 20 stack army, and then the Arverni just raised a new army outside of Massalia. Still wishing that they loved me so they would give me a trade agreement. Uh, and then we had the Apyros navy is sailing towards Sicily, I don't know why, and the other Pyros fleet is sailing back from Syracuse towards Illyria. So it looks like a Pyros is in a full recall mode. Lusitanian fleet is sailing out. It looks like they're moving towards me because I declared war. I wish they wouldn't, but I guess they're going to try to 
I mean, they're fleets. So I don't know what they're going to do. They're definitely not 20 stacks either, but I'd rather not waste money on re-recruiting units into my fleet right now. Remember, I still want to upgrade Legio 2, right, to a Polybian army. Plus, I'm going to start building a shield maker and I have to upgrade all of my armor. Like, I need thousands upon thousands, tens of thousands of denarii to upgrade. And that's not even counting building my buildings and other stuff. So it looks like the Dumnoni just took Iluliobana. That is the uh, Atrabate city. So we're going to probably get a trade agreement canceled here, unfortunately, among other things. So... I would like to welcome you to turn 79. We are in a beautiful summer of 259 BCE. And things really worked out well. Our income jumped up, and that's probably from uh, selling slaves. So the use of mercenaries. Maintaining your strength this far from home may prove difficult. You should consider hiring mercenaries to bolster your forces. I'll do mercenary contracts, right? I'm not going to recruit any, but there's no downside to it. Aria Calvina has returned from her mission. Trade agreement dissolved. The Atrabates, right? They lost their port. And an increase in rank. Marcus Junius Brutus, the general. So it looks like uh, because I put that uh, veteran in his army, it gave him a little bit of level up there, right? And then that's it for our most pressing matter. So to continue turn 79, we'll check out our event messages. Unseasonal conditions. A warm summer in Illyricum. That's positive. Character trait report. Marcus Caecilius Scorus has become anxious aged so we'll check that out first go down to marcus caecilius scores he's a governor that is governing in latium and just to look at it anxious aged apprehensive cowardly stingy minus two growth per turn in the local province minus one cultural conversion passive action minus one percent empire maintenance and minus eight percent construction costs Eh, right? Not good, not bad, just kind of eh. Sextus Antonius Dento has become philosophic aged. So looking at him, philosophic aged. Cultured, pedantic, cowardly. Minus 6% chance of successful assassination. That's okay, we don't do that. Plus 5 unit experience gained per turn for the parent army. That's good. Plus 6% replenishment rate for all units. That's good. And plus 6% morale for all units during offensive battles, parent army. So that's good. We're good that he's more philosophic. And then Septimus Nigidius Plancus has become obsessive aged. So remember, he's our governor in Sicily now. Looking at obsessive aged, minus two growth per turn in the local province. Culture, plus one cultural conversion, passive action. Minus one percent empire maintenance and minus eight percent construction cost local province. So that's good. Then his default characteristic was self-made. Education and upbringing are the foundations of character. Plus one cunning, plus two percent empire maintenance, and plus four cultural conversion in the local province. So good for him. We have issued the Cell Slaves Edict in Corsica at Sardinia, and we have issued the Cell Slaves Edict in Sicilia. And then we have troubled populaces in both Cisalpina and Corsica at Sardinia. That is actually good. And then remember, with our Cell Slaves Edict and our slaves dropping, our public order will go up. So just looking at Sicily. We are down to 54.8% slaves and 59.5%. Those modifiers are taking effect, but we won't see that slave drop until next turn. So you see, we didn't see 15% drop just yet, but we will see it shortly. And then increase in rank, Marcus Junius Brutus. We'll go ahead and uh, see that now, and then we'll actually do our spotlight while we're here. So looking at Marcus Junius Brutus. He is in-game a military tribune. War is Roman's true vocation. Plus one gravitas per turn. Enables the ability inspire and rally. Plus two percent tax rate in the local province. And plus one loyalty for the political party this character belongs to. Academic. Education and upbringing are the foundations of character. Plus ten percent civil research rate faction-wide. Character starts at a higher intellectual trait. Plus one gravitas per turn. And plus five percent unit recruitment. And then narcissistic aged. Indul indulgent, vain, and selfish. Minus two growth per turn in the local province. Plus 25% chance of evading enemy agents. Plus 30% chance of wounding enemy agents in self-defense. And then plus 2% empire maintenance. The ones that he can change are scrapper, type brawler. How to increase as low bodyguard casualties, victories, and age. How to decrease as high bodyguard casualties. He is mediocre. Plus 1% melee attack skill for the commander's unit. 
plus 1% melee defense skill for the commander's unit, and minus 1% morale for the commander's unit army only. He's also a deputy type commander. How to increase his low casualties at victories and age. How to decrease his high casualties. Clueless, but learning. Minus 5% campaign map movement range, plus 3% upkeep for all land units, and minus 1% morale for all units during battles in foreign territory. And the last one is Erudite, Type Intellectual, how to increase its high public order, libraries, skills, and age, how to decrease its low public order. A promising pupil, he should seek out academies. Plus one growth per turn, plus one authority, plus two cultural conversion in the local province, and plus two percent tax rate. He also has an educated wife. Men, my darling, do not look at women's mind first, and I have a sharp mind. Plus two cunning, plus two loyalty from marriage, and plus two to the chance of having children. And then if you recall, he's got the watch goose, the crisis manager, and the executioner. Those are all for public order. His default skill is providentia. Fate has fired many arrows at this man, and he has dodged them all. Plus one cunning, and plus 10% chance of evading enemy agents. He's 47 years old, he has three ambition, which is pretty high, and he has 231 gravitas. So we're going to go ahead and upgrade him. First thing, we're going to go into Military Logistician. Every battle can be won before it is even fought. Plus one Cunning. Minus 5% upkeep for all land and ship units. Right, so that's for the upkeep. Then we're going to go into Commander of Men. I have seen countless enemies as well as comrades fall before me. Plus one Authority and plus 2% morale for all units. Right, that's because, well, he's a general. He needs authority. And then uh, that'll do it. So it looks like he went to level 2, not level 3. So the game must have got that wrong. He has 5 authority, 7 cunning, and 3 zeal. So what about Marcus Junius Brutus, right? And his brother, Legia 1 over here, Decimus Junius Brutus, in real life. Well, like I said, there wasn't a lot about them. Information on both of these brothers is rather sparse. Every time I tried to Google them, I really came into just, you know, the Marcus Junius Brutus that killed Caesar. So here's what I found out. Decimus Junius Brutus Skaeva served as a legate to the council Spurius Carvilius Maximus in 293 BCE during the Third Samnite War. In 292 BCE, when Decimus Junius Brutus was serving as consul, Spurius Carvilius Maximus served as his legate and defeated the Valaseconds. In 264 BCE, both Decimus and Marcus Junius Brutus organized the first known gladiatorial games in Rome. That's it. That's literally all I could find. There was nothing on the Junii here. There's a lot other Junii people, but not these two, unfortunately. So that's where we're going to leave it with probably the shortest spotlight known to mankind. Anyways, that handles our spotlight and our event messages. Moving on to our agents, we are going to just deploy Ulpia Sever where she is. And uh, she discovered an enemy warlord, Childeric of the Lugos, outside of Coria. And we located Coria. So Coria and Octoduron are both open and ripe for the taking when we get the ability to take them. Looking at Mamemia and Hanobarba, we are also going to keep her where she is so she can successfully gain vision of Patavium and Norea. It looks like Norea did weather the siege against the Apuli, and it looks like the Blood Swans led by the High King Ivo continue to besiege Medhalan. So not much there. As for our governors, they're still administrating, and as for our veterans, they're still, you know, training the troops, right? Trying to shorten it up and not really investigate too much time into other things. Looking at the faction tab, we have a 0% chance of civil war and balanced influence rate in the Senate. So we're just going to check and see if a uh, lovely lady needs to go out and organize games anywhere. We will have to organize games in Cisalpina if we want that extra bonus, which we... Do. So let's see if the price is right. The price is right. So for 1,196 denarii, we will have uh, Menenia Graca of the Gens Junia go ahead and organize games in Sicil, China. That's good. That handles our faction tab. We're going to skip our buildings for now as we know how. Looking at our armies, right, Legio 1, led by Decimus Junius Brutus, is still uh, raiding in Segestica. We will bring him back in the fall to our territory to basically replenish and gain more supplies and not suffer uh, winter attrition. It looks like it says here, foraging for food. The army is foraging for supplies, but the region is a devastated region. 
finding supplies is getting harder as the region is devastated. So because we've been basically raiding for so long, we've used up most of our supplies in that region. We're going to have to go ahead and have Legio 1 leave at some point. Looking at Legio 5, led by Marcus Junius Brutus, we are recovering nicely, right? We still have that one really injured Principe unit. It did go up to 33 men per turn here, so it looks like most of the Legion will recover in this turn. There will be a couple units that are still going to be, you know, not fully recovered, but potentially we can have him move out and either start raiding in the fall, or maybe even march on Patavium if we want to be a little risky. We'll go from there. We are going to move Legio 2 right onto the border. I can't, so with Medhalan under siege, I can technically move around Medhalan right now. So that's the nice thing. When Medhalan is under siege, they no longer have that area of denial. So we're actually going to think about being a little risky here. I'm going to go ahead and march him right across the border. We still do have positive public order in Genoa, and we're going to have Legio 2 start raiding Medhalan. Right, give us a little bit of an income boost. I didn't realize that when the city is being raided, they lose their area of denial. So we're just going to raid Medhalan as we watch the Blood Swans, led by Ivo, just siege the city. And like I said, when he's sieging, his units are continuing to take casualties. So I'm good for it. Right now I have two enemies that are wearing each other down while I just sit there and watch. Go for it. Legio 2, led by Lucius Julius Libo. He isn't at full strength. I do have one unit of Princapes that's still damaged, and they are still all Camillan era, but I'm okay with that. I think even being in the Camillan era, he'll be okay with his units. Legio 4, led by Lucius Papyrus Cursor, is still patrolling in Latium. We're going to keep him there for the public order and the money. Legio 6, led by Lucius Cornelius Scipio, is patrolling north of Carolus. Just clicking on the lines of Tanit, I am worried that they might try to land and do damage. So we're going to have Legio 6 stop patrolling, and we're going to have him fortify just outside of Carolus. And then Legio 3, led by Gnaeus Cornelius Scipio Asina, we're going to have him go back to a patrol stance because there is no longer a threat to him there. We are going to redeploy Classes as 1, though, like I wanted to. And we're going to have Classes as 1 actually sail into the port of Panormos. So we're going to take a pretty hefty hit there to public order. But he's only got two turns left before he runs out of supplies, and I want to have him ready to move out next turn if I need to, you know, intercept any Carthaginian ships. And the good news is Sicily can take the public order loss, so I'm okay with it. And then we'll leave Classicists both 2 and 3, just patrolling where they are. And that handles our main stuff. Uh, we will circle back here, spend that money, and we're probably going to spend it in I'm just looking at what we can do. I'm probably going to spend it in Carolus. Yeah. So we'll look at Carolus. I really do want to upgrade this iron mine, but we still haven't got the money. We'll probably do it next turn. So we're going to upgrade the pacified capital to an allied state. So we're going to go from minus two to minus five food. We can afford that three food loss. Plus two to plus three growth per turn for an extra growth per turn. Plus two to plus three squalor for an extra squalor. 338 to 563 wealth from subsistence. Plus 5 to plus 10% wealth from all sources, and then plus 0.1 to plus 0.5% first, second, and third class citizens, plus a little bit of an extra garrison. So for 4,095 Nari in six turns, we'll upgrade that allied capital, and uh, that'll bankrupt us. So that's okay. That's what the money's for. We use money to make money. Looking at our campaign map, Gaul is still quiet. So Massalia does have those. Massalia, geez going back in time. The Arverni, who are in control of Massalia, still have a 20 stack there, led by the General. Uh, and then they have the fleet that's recruiting, and they have a 1 stack outside. So far, the uh, Dunoinai are on the offensive. They still control Lemanon and uh, Namnatum, and they did take Eulobiana from the Atrobates. So the Atrobates did lose some territory. We'll see if the Arverni do successfully go on the offensive. The Blood Swans, led by the High King Ivo, are still besieging Medhalan. And then, like I said, Norea successfully weathered the siege by the Apuli. And it looks like they actually didn't lose as many men as I thought. So maybe they didn't weather the siege. Maybe the Apuli literally just broke off the siege. That's what it actually looks like. And then in the Greek theater, nothing has changed. Uh, the Apirotes are still on four cities, and the Getae are still on two. 
Looking at Sicily, we have uh, two judges, and then the mercenary veteran Carthalon came back. So he's not deployed, but he came back, and then we have one judge in Magna Gratia. And then in North Africa, we still do have those Massa Sicily armies just hanging out there. And then we have an enemy transport ship, the Sacred Company here, led by Niptanus. It actually can land on Sicily and attack. So we're going to go ahead and switch Legio 2 back to a fortified stance. Just because I don't want to risk it, right? I want to be as safe as possible. And then, like I said, we have uh, the Lions of Tanit, led by Harmatius. That's a transport fleet that's just south of Carolus. They look like they can attack Carolus at any moment. It doesn't look like they can land. But, like I said, I put Legio 6 into that fortified stance just in case. And then we have an enemy fleet. The Scions of Sidon. It's a 19 stack. They're undergoing attrition, but they are recruiting. So that giant fleet there is actually a negative. So it looks like Carthage is actually making a resurgence here out in uh, out in my Corsica at Sardinia and uh, Sicil Sicilian territory. So definitely is something to keep an eye on. I do have classes of one in the port there, so they can deploy at a moment's notice, but if I get stuck in some fleet combat, that's going to really eat into my income here, because I'm going to have to, you know, basically make a whole bunch of new ships for the ones that I lose. So yeah, that handles that. Looking at diplomacy, I am going to try to contact the Arverni again and uh, get a trade agreement. You honor us. There's food enough for two armies awaiting us when we have talked. We are only plus 59 now, so we actually lost two. We went, or three, we went from plus 62 to plus 59. And the success is low, so we're not even going to bother trying to get a uh, trade agreement from them. Uh, looking at the Vivisi, things are still good. We are a plus 84 value there. The Asatani were actually a plus 69 value. So we're going to look at potentially trading with them. Welcome! We will talk and then we will feast until our guts rumble and our backsides ache from overuse. Success chance is low, so unfortunately they won't agree to that. So we're going to go ahead and just not try. And then we're going to go scroll over here. Pretty much everyone else is uh, very unfriendly with us, right? The Lusotanans we're at war with. The Venetians we're at war with, along with the Lugos. And then the Nervi we're at war with, but they're far enough away that it doesn't matter. Same with the Dunoni. Uh, like I said, the Arverni still like me, so there's that. Pyros still likes me. Uh, just looking here, a Pyros is at war with Carthage and the Getai. The Getai are at war with a Pyros. Uh, the Thinni are at war with Sparta. The Apuli are at war with the Venetians. Pergamon is at war with Parsa and the Seleucidae. So it looks like, I guess, I don't know, maybe I sweep down here and I take the Illyrian coast like I want part of Macedonia, and then maybe I do take all this territory, right? I take all of Macedonia, I take all of Thrace, and maybe I take all of Dacia and Pannonia. Maybe I just work on going this way and uh, kind of just hold Carthage where they're at. Um, I'm not sure, like I said, what I want to do, but for now... That's kind of where I'm at. And, uh, yeah. I think that covers pretty much what I want to do. You know, we're already up to well over an hour and a half. Like I said, we did a battle, so we'll never cover as many turns as we want. But I'm pretty happy with that. We'll do a quick roundup, and then we'll call it a day. So, in Eodair, in Illyricum, minus 43 and minus 1. Not bad. We're generating 637 denarii in Eodair. Looking at Genoa. And uh, Cisalpina, minus 37 plus 8, generating 948 denarii. Looking at Corsica at Sardinia, minus 49 plus 6, generating 960 denarii. Remember, we do not have a patrolling army. It is actually a fortified army. So we're actually plus 6 without a patrolling army. And then in Sicily, right, we are minus 40 with minus 11. That minus 11 is coming primarily from classes as 1 being in the port of Panormos, but like I said, I really do want to get them there. Uh, we have 4,028 denarii coming in, and uh, remember, Legio 3 is fortified. They are not patrolling, so we lose those uh, wealth and that public order bonus there. In Magna Gratia, we are minus 7 with plus 1, so with Carthalon gone, we are successfully recovering public order. Not nearly as fast as I want, but remember, once we... Uh, shipped what we're doing with our edicts, we're going to sell slaves in Magna Gratia and Latium when we get the chance. Then in Latium, we are 24 plus 3. So once again, recovering public order, not nearly as fast as I liked, but I think it's safe to stay 
that our four primary provinces here, right, the core of what will be the Roman Empire, but what is the Roman Republic, is stable. Once again, Iadar and Genoa are still a little bit fluctuating, but once they become core provinces, we'll be good. Other than that, like I said, we do have to keep an eye on Carthage here. We've got the lines of Tanit and the Scions of Sidon. It's a lot of units, right? That's going to be 40 units right there. So if they do decide to attack Carolus, I think we can hold for now. But it's going to be touch and go, right? So it's probably in my best interest to start fortifying Carolus and then Sicily, right? Best I can. And like I said, I only have two legions and one navy kind of covering those. Any loss of territory in Corsica at Sardinia or Sicily would be absolutely detrimental to my war effort, considering my money continues to remain on a knife's edge. Now, it is plus 7,276, but, you know, not nearly where I want it to be. Anyways, that's that. We're going to go ahead and zoom in on the Venetian area here, right? Right on the Po River Valley south of the Alps and call it a day. So with that, I would like to uh, thank you all for tuning in to uh, episode 34, the battle, well, war, the battle of Patavia. I will uh, see you guys next time, and I hope you had a good one. See ya!